and I will uh, prepare another short talk for your lab review to show you where the main focus for the final lab exam. Uh, we covered the material during the lectures, but I will do it again so that you, you know what you need to know for the lab exam. I have, I think, a few questions. It's not going to be that many. And I hope uh, uh, this journey was, was worthwhile. It was a long one, especially for me. And uh, I'm sure it is for you as well. And I hope you learned something. And uh, this is an important system down the road. I know it might have been a bit difficult for you, but I'm sure that you will carry on. And uh, in this lecture, you, we will talk about the control of ventilation, control of breathing, regulation of respiration. Uh, they all mean the same thing. They are just different terminologies or synonyms. And these are the list of objectives. There are so many of them. And uh, may, as I said before, you have to go through these objectives before you start reading the lectures because it tells you where the focus should be. Now, this is a schematic overview, a schematic representation of the respiratory control system. Uh, the main control system is really located within the brain stem, particularly in the medulla. And uh, there are different types of nuclei and the neurons and centers that regulate our uh, tidal breathing, like, for example, the dorsal respiratory group. Uh, we have uh, the ventral respiratory group. Uh, we have uh, others that we'll be talking about. And then you can see that the respiratory centers in the brain or the respiratory neurons in the brain are affected by inputs from peripheral chemoreceptors. Okay, as well as central chemoreceptors, we have chemoreceptors which are sensitive to oxygen, to the levels of oxygen, levels of carbon dioxide, levels of hydrogen ion and we'll be talking about these. And we have also central chemoreceptors, and these central chemoreceptors are primarily stimulated by hydrogen ions secondary to an increase in carbon dioxide. And we also have non-chemical control where we have some inputs from the lung itself, like, or from the airways, of, or from the cardiovascular system, muscles and joint, etc skin even, where we have, for example, inflation of the lung or overinflation of the lung will affect the breathing. If you have pulmonary congestion, it will affect the breathing. So these inputs eventually will go to the respiratory centers and modify or regulate the cyclic pattern of breathing. Most important are these things, the central and peripheral chemoreceptors. That, I'm not saying that these are not important, but these are, for example, the muscle and joint receptors are probably stimulated during exercise, and that's why we have exercise hyperpnea. And then, in addition to this, we have higher centers in the brain that could modify breathing. For example, there are areas or let's say the cerebral cortex could affect the cyclic pattern of our breathing or the respiratory neurons which are involved in the regulation of our breathing. Because, for example, one can hold his, his breath and stop breathing for a little bit of a time, a short period of time. So the inputs, voluntary control or voluntary modification, let us say, could occur by inputs from the cerebral cortex. And um, however, I mean, you know, we don't think of breathing too much, so a lot of times this voluntary control does not occur unless we have to, unless I want to, for example, to hyperventilate voluntarily or hold my breath voluntarily. So the cyclic pattern of breathing, really, and the way by which we breathe and the automaticity and the rhythmicity of our breathing 
is controlled by these in, uh, or the cyclic inspiration that occurs during normal tidal breathing is basically controlled by, by, by neurons or by centers which are located in the brain stem. And the activity of the neurons which control the breathing in the brain stem are affected by mainly by these receptors, the chemoreceptors, which are some of them are located in like the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies. But there are also within the brain stem itself or within the medulla itself, we have these central chemoreceptors which are mainly sensitive to hydrogen ion due to a large increase or to a higher level of carbon dioxide. So we'll be talking about this in some more details. Let's hope that central control of our breathing. Uh, the main brain neurons which control our breathing are located in two major areas, the medulla right there and the bones. Uh, the bones respiratory centers include the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center. And uh, the pneumotaxic center apparently inhibits the apneustic center and thus send signals to the dorsal respiratory group uh, after the initiation of the inspiratory phase of our breathing so that it, it, it stops and then we go to the expiratory phase. And it's believed that after experimental studies that if you make a lesion or damage or the connection between the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center right here, the apneustic center becomes a free and sends in, sends its input to the dorsal respiratory group so that our breathing pattern become very deep and prolonged, something known as amnestic breathing. Uh, the importance of this is still debatable, but it's mentioned in the literature. We go down to the medullary respiratory center. We have three groups or three uh, types of neurons. One group of neurons are located dorsally, which is known as dorsal respiratory group. And these are the ones which send action potentials to the phrenic nerve and excite the phrenic nerve, which will lead to contraction of the diaphragm and initiate the inspiratory phase of a breathing. After the inspiration is, is, is over, apparently the pneumotaxic center inhibits the apneustic center and this will cause uh, the cessation of the neuronal activity in the dorsal respiratory group so that inspiration will end and our expiration will start. Now, the ventral respiratory group is as a complex. It has both inspiratory and expiratory neuron. It receives input from the dorsal respiratory group and sends input to the dorsal respiratory group. And this one is actually inactive during tidal breathing because tidal breathing depends on inputs from the dorsal respiratory group to initiate the inspiration. And af after this activity of this group is turned off, we go to the expiration, which is basically due to the elastic recoil of the lung. So we don't need the, the, to activate any muscles. However, the ventral respiratory group may, may also uh, assess the through its inspiratory neuron may assess the dorsal respiratory group neuron during forceful inspiration it, and it also send inputs to the expiratory muscles when we when we want to go for a forceful exhalation so it is believed that some of the neurons here particularly the expiratory neurons in the ventral respiratory group complex uh, uh, that it sends excitatory signals to the spinal cord and then to the motor neuron to the motor neurons in the spinal cord which innervate the expiratory muscles like the internal intercostals and the abdominal muscles this is from your book this is again the pneumotaxic center as i said it seems that the inputs from the pneumotaxic center inhibits the activity of the apneustic center and once it does so what's uh, what's going to happen it will switch off the dorsal respiratory group activity and this is the ventral expiratory group now i just want to remind you that we have expiratory as well as inspiratory neuron in this area whereas in the dorsal group we have only inspiratory neuron 
and again this this is the area which apparently send the signal down uh, to the phrenic nerve through descending pathways to the phrenic nerve excite the phrenic nerve and uh, probably the external intercostal muscle and this will lead to the contraction of the muscle and the process of ventilation and here again see these are the respiratory motor neurons these are the descending pathways they will make synapses with motor neurons for example with the phrenic nerve and the phrenic nerve will go and innervate the diagram and here he is focusing here on inputs from the vagus and the glossopharyngeal nerve the vagus carries signals from all over the place in the lung and it also carry signals from the aortic from the aortic chemoreceptors which are sensitive to hypoxia and sensitive to hydrogen ion and co2 and it also receives input from the glossopharyngeal nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve i'm sure that you have learned from your anatomy it's the nerve that carries the carotid baroreceptor sig signal to the vasomotor area Again, the glossopharyngeal nerve takes the signal from the carotid baroreceptor and modify the activity of the dorsal respiratory group. Now, this might be a more detailed diagram. It shows you where each one is going. So we talked about the pneumotaxic center and we talked about the apneustic center. These are connected with the medullary respiratory center which contains mainly the probe zinger group, which sets the rhythm. And we have the dorsal respiratory group, and here we have the ventral respiratory group and the probe zinger complex. This guy apparently is a rhythmic generator or the base maker in your own, okay? It goes to inspiratory neurons apparently in the, uh, in the ventral group, so to speak, and set the rhythm. And uh, it, it, it is also apparently connected somehow with the inspiratory neurons which are located here. The details of this is not known, but the bottom line, you can see the dorsal inspiratory group. It sends descending pathways to the, to the phrenic nerve that goes mainly to the diaphragm and other motor neurons maybe which innervate the external intercostal under normal conditions and it will initiate the, the, the inspiratory phase of our respiratory cycle. Now you can see that inspiratory neurons here also may affect the activity of the spinal motor neurons innervating the muscles of inspiration and I said those which are located in the inspiratory group are probably activated during intense breathing when we want to make deep inspiration. Now, the, you can see there is a correlation between the expiratory and inspiratory neurons uh, so that, you know, one, the activity of one could affect the other. But again, as I said, uh, uh, the inspiratory neuron sends more input to the expiratory neurons than the other way around. And it seems that during inspiration, this expiratory neurons here are silent. They, they, they don't. But they are activated. For example, if I want to take forceful expiration, they send, direct, they send inputs through descending motor pathways to the motor neurons which innervate the muscles involved in forceful expiration, like, for example, the intercostal muscles, the internal intercostal, and the abdominal muscles. And then, as you can see, uh, if we activate the inspiratory muscles, we'll uh, get the, the inspiration. And of course, under tidal breathing from a member, uh, somehow the activity of this dorsal respiratory group, which sends input to the phrenic nerve and initiate the inspiratory phase, is somehow turned off probably by the pneumotaxic center. And then the process of ventilation starts here by inspiration. And then when the activity of this dorsal group is, is switched off probably by the pneumotaxic center, we go to the expiratory phase. And under normal condition, the expiratory phase does not require input from the expiratory neuron in the ventral respiratory group. It's, it's a passive process. 
due to the elastic recoil of the lung. However, in the event we need to breathe forcefully, apparently somehow these expiratory neurons in the ventral respiratory group potentially send inputs to the expiratory motor neurons which innervate the expiratory muscle and cause forceful expiration. And you can see even, you know, at, 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 even if we breathe, okay, the ventilation will eventually control the partial pressure of gases. So for one reason or the other, if we have changes in the partial pressure of CO2 or in hydrogen ion, or if we have hypoxia, we have these peripheral chemoreceptors, arterial chemoreceptors located within the medulla, uh, located within the carotid arteries and the aortic bodies. And these will go and modify the activity of the dorsal respiratory group. And of course, this dorsal respiratory group, as I said, there are close by neurons which are known as central chemoreceptors, which are sensitive mainly to an increase in CO2 indirectly by increasing the level of hydrogen ions. And then, of course, we have strict receptors. And these strict receptors, for example, uh, there are in different places and they could also modify the activity of the dorsal respiratory group and potentially could modify the, 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 breathing, the, uh, the breathing pattern. And uh, as I said uh, uh, at the beginning, inputs from the hypothalamus and the limbic system, uh, I'm sure you have an idea about it. If not, you will learn it in neuroscience course next year may modify the activity and for example the limbic system input could be the cause of the breathing better that may occur for example during an anxiety during sadness or whatever it is you know so you know at me you know it's not really that so one can say the brain different brain areas are involved in the control of ventilation However, normally, more the, the, the control of ventilation is basically a function of the uh, respiratory centers located in the medulla, the dorsal and the ventral group, as well as the pneumotaxic center in the bones. Not to forget, of course, the connection of these to the motor neurons in the spinal cord and the innervation of the expiratory and the inspiratory muscles. Now, this slide here shows you some more description. It goes to some more details. Uh, they are located, the dorsal respiratory group is located bilaterally in the nucleus of the tractus solitarius. Uh, this is an area in the brain stem. It is a very important area. Whether you want to know it at this point or not, I really don't think you should know it because just keep it in mind because you will learn exactly the anatomical position of this area once you go to the neuroscience. And uh, they are the principal initiator of the activity of the phrenic nerve. That's important to remember. Uh, they send collaterals to the ventral respiratory group, as I showed in the previous slide. And uh, the, the, the collaterals from the ventral respiratory group to the dorsal is very limited. The nucleus tractus solitarius also receives visceral efferents from the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve, and these are important for different type of reflexes, in new, including reflexes which are initiated or evoked by changes in the level of CO2, hydrogen ion, and oxygen. And uh, uh, the vagus nerve also carry information of stretch receptors in the lung and uh, like the juxtapulmonary receptors and uh, uh, so you know it, it does a lot of things we'll talk about these reflexes other than the chemical reflexes that where the signal from these receptors is carried through the vagus as we go down let me try to regroup uh, it fires in, uh, in, in a certain manner so that the activity increases steadily and then it switches off suddenly. And uh, the increase, you know, it does not occur, yeah, and the firing does not occur immediately, but it occurs a bit slower and it goes up, 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 and then it switched off. And this pattern is known as a ramp signal. 
يعني كانه الواحد مسند طالع على طلعه ف it begins with weak play activity and increases steadily in a minute for like two seconds and then when it when the activity of the neurons in the dorsal respiratory group reaches maximum activity then they are switched off and the, during the switch on it's going to activate of course the phrenic nerve so that it causes the aphromatic contraction and we initiate the inspiratory phase of our respiratory cycle and then when it's switched off the diaphragm is going to be relaxed again and we go to the expiratory phase which occurs as a result of the passive recoil of the lung and the advantage of of this ram pattern or this characteristics of this ram signal that it causes steady increase in the volume of lungs during inspiration rather than gasping يعني مش من احنا هتتايد الفوليوم بسرعة على السريع منه خلال الثانيتين ومنعبي ريتين مش كل شوية نصير من ندخل شوية هواء هلا في الانسبيراتوري رامب is controlled by the rate of increase of the ramp signal or how fast is the increase while you are ascending the ramp and this prevent gasping and it has a limit or a duration it's a limiting point at which the ramp suddenly ceases or stop uh, which is the usual method for controlling the rate of respiration so in a sense the activity or the strength of the activity during uh, the ramp or the rate of increase of the ramp signal controls basically the 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 the, the, the intake of air so that we take in it you know really quick without no gasping Whereas the point where it's switched on is gonna control the rate of breathing. Okay. Uh, so the shorter the the shorter the duration of inspiration and the higher the frequency, if the switch off sees earlier. Okay. And let me show you what I mean by this. This is what I meant by a RAM signal. You start the activity here, it increases quickly. Steadily, it goes up, up, and the activity keeps going up, increasing until it, we, it reaches like at this point, and then it stops. And then, of course, we have the three seconds, and then we start a ramp signal again, a ramp signal again, and so on and so forth. And now, apparently, this ramp signal is shut off by the pneumotaxic center. Okay, so the pneumotaxic center by switching off. The activity of the dorsal respiratory group limits the, 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 the inspiratory phase. So if you have damage or uh, uh, damage in the pneumotaxic center, as I said, you will end up with pneumatic or prolonged deep inspiration. And this is due to the fact that apparently this ramp function, this ramp signal does not switch off at the time where it's supposed to switch off. Okay. properties of the ventral respiratory group neurons which are located in the medullary respiratory center uh, it, it contains as I said both inspiratory and expiratory neurons and they are located in a couple of nuclei one of them is known as the nucleus ambiguous and the other one is known as the nucleus retroambiguous God, again if you want to know the details of these because you don't know the neural anatomy in such depth so it's just maybe at this point enough to know what's the ventral respiratory group are and what's their function and then when you take the neuroscience in year three i am sure you will take the details of the of the uh, anatomical structures located in the brain stem and you will remember them again and uh, uh, some of these neurons mainly make synaptic contact with inspiratory muscles and expiratory muscles of course through through the the motor neurons that goes to these muscles in the spinal cord uh, and one thing to remember you know the, this thing the nucleus ambiguous is involved in swallowing swallowing among other things and uh, it sends motor inputs to different uh, muscles in the larynx and the pharynx and the tongue muscles so through the vagus nerve and uh, because see the vagus has two components a motor and a sensory the motor ones originate in the brain stem in the nucleus ambiguous 
and they innervate these muscles. And apparently, the the, the input from the nucleus ambiguous through the vagal motor neurons to the motor uh, to, to, to these muscles apparently uh, keep them in a, in, in, in a state where the airways are opened or patent. And uh, as I said, the uh, ventral respiratory group remain active during uh, remain inactive during normal inspiration, so they are silent in a way. The ventral respiratory group do not appear to participate in the basic rhythm, like the dorsal respiratory group or the probotzinger uh, group. It has no pacemaker activity, and apparently it could be activated though by the dorsal respiratory group to act and assist the dorsal respiratory group in sensing more signals to the motor neurons which are involved in, uh, in ventilation, for example, during exercise. And uh, one other function of the ventral respiratory group that it sends signal to the abdominal muscles, of course, through the spinal cord, through the, the motor neurons of the spinal cord that innervate these muscles so, uh, during heavy exercise. Center where I showed you where it's located. It's located in the upper bones. And uh, it apparently functions to fine tune the breathing pattern. And it makes the transition between inspiration and expiration smooth. And apparently it is these neurons by sending inputs either directly or through the apneustic, by inhibiting the apneustic center. It controls the switch off point of the inspiratory ramp. In other words, after the activity of the dorsal respiratory group is initiated and the ramp signal reaches its maximum, it is turned off. It stops suddenly. And what makes it stops apparently is inputs from the pneumotaxic center, either directly or indirectly through the apneustic by inhibiting the apneustic center. And, and by doing this, by limiting the duration of the ramp and making the switch off of the dorsal respiratory group neurons activity, the end result of the function of the pneumotaxic center is to determine the rate of ventilation as well as the tidal volume. It might be also important in modulation of the response of the dorsal respiratory group from peripheral inputs, like from inputs uh, from the lung, like during lung inflation, or when we have change in, when we have hypercabinia or elevated partial pressure of CO2 or low partial pressure of oxygen or hypoxia. The apneustic center, it's in the lower bones. In, in experimental animals, it inhibits the switch off of the inspiratory signal lamp. In other words, it keeps the ramp signal or the activity of the dorsal respiratory group going. And if this is what it is, then what it's going to do, it's going to increase the tidal volume and the duration of inspiration with occasional gasps, expiratory gasps. It is, its activity, apparently, as I said, is inhibited by the pneumotaxic center and by vagal impulses. The importance of this in man is not very well documented, but it is documented in experimental animals. Now we go to the control, the chemical control of breathing or ventilation or respiration. And this is a very important aspect of the control of breathing. Beyond the, the CNS control, I mean, the CNS control is the one which basically starts our breathing, control the rhythm of our breathing. Now, to maintain adequate levels of partial pressure of CO2 and O2, the, the, the central areas, particularly the dorsal respiratory group, maybe the pneumotaxic center or whatever it is, receive inputs from sensors or chemoreceptors that are located some of them are located within the brain stem itself. Others are located in the, in, the, in the bifurcation of the carotid artery 
or in the aortic arch. So when we speak about control, we have to start first with the chemoreceptors, okay? We have first of all central chemoreceptors, which is close by to the respiratory centers right there, okay? And this is the inspiratory area, which is the dorsal respiratory group. And then we have peripheral chemoreceptors, and these peripheral chemoreceptors are located in two areas, in the carotid body right there. This is the carotid artery, and that's where it divides into two, its, to its main component. It's located right here at the bifurcation of the carotid. And some of these receptors are also located within the aortic, uh, within the aortic artery, the aortic arch right here. And they are known as the aortic bodies. Now, the central chemoreceptors here are located in the ventral medulla right here. And these are apparently mediate the effect of CO2 as well as hydrogen ions on the ventilation by sending signals to the respiratory neurons right here in the dorsal respiratory group. Now, these key central chemoreceptors are sensitive to CO2 and hydrogen ion, but their primary stimulus is through hydrogen ion. Because see, hydrogen ions, if we have an elevation in hydrogen ions in our plasma or in our blood, these cannot cross the blood brain barrier. But CO2, when it's elevated, it, it can pass, okay, it can pass through the blood brain barrier. And when it reaches the cerebrospinal fluid, CO2 will react with water to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid will dissociate to bicarbonate and hydrogen. And hydrogen, hydrogen is the one which is going to work on the chemosensitive area right here. Okay, and modify the activity of the dorsal respiratory group or other groups in the brain stem which might be involved in the respiration. Here, I think he made it here for a shortcut because the chemosensitive area is here. So there must be some communication between this area. But I think he did it for clarity here to show you that the CO2 effect are mediated through the formation of hydrogen ion in the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, if you take the carotid and the aortic bodies, these are the peripheral chemoreceptors. And... Uh, uh, I mean, they respond to changes in CO2 and hydrogen ion, but they are mainly here really for detecting hypoxia. So the, the primary drive usually, or the primary drive and uh, the primary regulator of our adequate breathing is CO2 in the blood. That's the main one. Those guys, they, it's true that they respond to changes in CO2 and pH or hydrogen ion, but they are there mainly to detect hypoxia. If the partial pressure of oxygen goes below 60 or 60 and below, the activity of these chemoreceptors in the aortic bodies and the carotid bodies is going to increase and they send a signal to the medulla through two nerves. The nerve which carries the signal from the carotid is the vagus nerve right there. And the nerve which carry the signal from the carotid bodies is the glossopharyngeal nerve. The glossopharyngeal nerve. The peripheral chemoreceptors. You can see the, the central chemoreceptors are located in the ventral medulla, the peripheral chemoreceptor in the aortic. As I, I just said this, in the aortic bodies, carotid bodies. The, the main response to carbon dioxide is mediated through the central receptors indirectly through the formation of hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions are the main drive for changing of the activity of the central chemoreceptors. The peripheral chemoreceptors, though they respond to CO2, partial pressure, and the pH or hydrogen ion concentration, their main function is really uh, for detecting hypoxia and adjust the respiratory 
better or the, our breathing so that we can get rid of excess carbon dioxide if we have hypercapnia or if to breathe more so that we get more oxygen to improve the level of partial pressure of oxygen during hypoxia. Uh, the main drive or for the activity of the central chemoreceptors by which they modify our breathing in response to hypercapnia or change in hydrogen ion concentration is basically through the direct action of hydrogen on these neurons in the brain. CO2 will have an effect, but it is indirect through the formation of bicarbonic acid in the cerebrospinal fluid. Now notice that hydrogen ion again does not cross the blood brain barrier. So apparently these central chemoreceptors are not sensitive or they do not respond to changes in plasma pH. But they will respond if we have, for example, for one reason or the other, an increase in the CO2, more CO2 will diffuse to the CSF, to the cerebrospinal fluid, and then form bicarbonic acid and the dissociation for bicarbonic acid to bicarbonate and hydrogen, and hydrogen is the one which is going to stimulate these central chemoreceptors. And apparently, most of the responses for the steady state or the continuous adjustment or to maintain a steady state level of breathing uh, and maintain adequate amount of oxygen intake and adequate amount of elimination of carbon dioxide. In a sense, most of the control is mediated through the central chemoreceptors, about 80 to 90 percent. Now, the arterial chemoreceptors contribute about 10 to 20 percent of the steady state response of, of, of our, of our uh, control of breathing. So most of the control apparently is a function of the central uh, chemoreceptors. Uh, and also, it seems that the response of the peripheral chemoreceptors or the arterial chemoreceptors is important in the short term, the transient response to carbon dioxide. So in other words, the continuous monitoring of CO2 is basically a function of the central chemoreceptor. It's the primary function of these receptors, and they contribute 80 to 90 percent of the steady state control, whereas the response of the peripheral chemoreceptors to hydrogen ion pH changes and uh, CO2 partial pressure is a transient. I mean, you know, when we have you know, some increase, I mean, their activity will just, it, in a sense, it has a short-term function or a short-term regulation. But for long-term regulation, it's basically the CO2 and the central chemoreceptors. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the carotid bodies, which are far more important than the aortic bodies in terms of detecting hypoxia. Um, the, both of them detect hypoxia, but this apparently the carotid bodies are more important. And as I said, the, the signal is carried to the brain stem to the respiratory center through the glossopharyngeal nerve. And the aortic bodies are located in the arch of the aorta, and the, the signal is transmitted via the vagus nerve. I just mentioned all of this. Uh, just I want to mention one thing here, that uh, these guys, they, they receive their own blood flow, they have their own blood supply through minute arteries directly from the adjacent arterial trunks where they are located. And uh, the, they receive high amount of blood flow compared to their body, it, com, compared to their weight. So their, their blood flow is so high to the point that even they can highly dependent on their blood, their oxygen supply to maintain their function can be dependent on the dissolved O2. Even if we have 
bar a low battery pressure of oxygen or whatever it is they don't apparently depend on the oxygen that's carried by hemoglobin and that's why these guys even in conditions where the O2 content or the amount of O2 that is being delivered to these receptors is getting low in cases like in anemia or carbon monoxide poisoning uh, the amount of O2 which is dissolved in a dissolved state reaching these receptors is generally normal even though the combined O2 in the blood is markedly depressed so that's what it is uh, because of their high blood flow even a decline in the O2 content is not gonna affect their function and that's good because you know I mean if, if their function is impaired by a decline in the O2 content we are in troubles because these cells or these receptors will not be able to respond of the chemoreceptors, the peripheral chemoreceptors to hypoxia, they are the only receptors which detect hypoxia. I mean, the central chemoreceptors do not detect changes in hypoxia. And that's why if we don't have these chemoreceptors to detect the hypoxia, uh, prog progressive hypoxia eventually will lead to depression of the respiratory centers. So they are important to be there and uh, the CO change in the CO2 concentration have no direct effect on the respiratory center itself to alter the respiratory drive or to increase the ventilation and O2 changes do have an indirect effect and uh, as I said uh, the O2 changes could lead to depression of the respiratory center in case we have a progressive hypoxia. The carotid bodies are much more important in the response to hypoxia than, the, the, than those counterparts, which are the aortic bodies. And in the absence of the peripheral chemoreceptors, as I said, the increased degree of hypoxia is a prog uh, will have a progressive direct depressive action on the central respiratory neurons. So we have to increase our ventilatory drive if our partial pressure of oxygen in blood drops up to 70 or between becomes 60 to 65. We have to do something about it. Otherwise, the hypoxia itself will cause depression of the respiratory central neurons. So, and the peripheral chemoreceptors apparently they work in a range, they start to detect the hypoxia when the partial pressure of O2 is below 70, and uh, they usually increase, cause an increase in ventilation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes, you know, you read it's about below 70, but usually that's really probably the threshold. It's like when the partial pressure of oxygen is about 60, that's when the, there is an increase in the activity of these chemoreceptors and, and the increase in ventilation consequently. And uh, one more thing that I wanted to say is that if you have hypoxia and an increase in the partial pressure of CO2, the response of hypoxia, the response of the peripheral chemoreceptor to hypoxia will be potentiated or it will be enhanced. Features of these uh, carotid or uh, peripheral chemoreceptors, aortic or carotid, here it's shown for the carotid, uh, 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 carotid body's receptor. There are two types of cells, the glomus cells or type 1 cells, and these are the ones which detect the hypoxia. Apparently, they have uh, oxygen channels. And uh, when there is hypoxia, apparently, the hypoxia modifies the activity of these channels. And through a series of steps, it causes the, the release of the neurotransmitters here. And these neurotransmitters will stimulate 
and set action potentials in the in this case the glossopharyngeal nerve or the vagus nerve in case of the aortic bodies and uh, the signal will reach to the respiratory center in the brain stem and increase the rate of ventilation the other type of cells are supportive cells so to speak they are glial like cells and uh, to maintain the function of these uh, receptors in a sense now that's the mechanism by which hypoxia stimulate these chemoreceptors in the aortic the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies if you have hypoxia here particularly when the partial pressure goes below 70 or between 60 and 50 these are the channels here apparently the the, the o2 sensitive channel will lead to the closure of the potassium channels and as a result of this uh, there will be depolarization of these cells there will be depolarization of these cells and uh, because apparently the efflux of calcium of potassium is declining here and as a result of this decline in the efflux of potassium ions there will, there will be depolarization and this depolarization will lead to the activation of uh, uh, calcium channels uh, L-type voltage gated calcium channels and once calcium ions enter the cells it causes the release of the neural the fusion of these vesicles which are located within uh, the glomus cells and eventually the release of the neurotransmitter via oxocytosis oxocytosis here uh, these vesicles apparently contain acetylcholine and another co-transmitter known ATP. These guys will depolarize the receptor and the depolarization of receptor will set action potentials in the afferent fibers that will eventually will reach the respiratory centers in the brain stem. Okay. Between alveolar ventilation and changes in uh, partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood this is the partial pressure here on the x-axis and this is the alveolar ventilation Th that's not in liter let's say this is the normal ventilation indicated by one and then this is double this is triple etc and you can see here bco2 is kept, is kept constant because we'll see, we'll see later that the effect of hypoxia the effect of the receptors or the increase in the ventilation when we have hypoxia in the presence of increased levels of pco2 will change so pco2 here is kept at the normal value which is about which is 40 millimeters of mercury this is the pco2 of the arterial blood here now you can see even if our inspired air or alveolar or arterial o2 will never get that high anyways but even though if you, this is the normal value about 100 you can see the rate of ventilation is about 5 liter let's say it's one unit now you can see that an increase in the alveolar ventilation start to occur basically when the partial pressure of oxygen gets to be below six below 70 and then between uh, at 60 there is a dramatic increase in the rate of alveolar ventilation and further lowering of the arterial PO2 will lead to further increase in ventilation and you can see that uh, there, might, there can be a six-fold increase in the rate of ventilation if the partial pressure of oxygen drops to 20. So it's a, it's a good mechanism to for you know increasing ventilation in cases we have hypo. Yeah, and we are just and what it does, this is uh, uh, shows this graph response or the activity or the number of action potential or impulses in the carotid body, afferent fibers, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve. And you can see here, this is the arterial BO2. Now, when we have, of course, this is an experiment, we'll never get to this value, but when they change the partial pressure of oxygen while doing this experiment, you can see at higher partial pressures of oxygen the activity of these nerves is so low it's so low however when you have a decline in the partial pressure of oxygen 
you can see that the activity of the glossopharyngeal nerve is extremely high. It's very high. What that means that these receptors are responsible for detecting hypoxia. Their activity increases when the partial pressure of oxygen is below 60 and start to decline if the partial pressure start to go up like to 80, 70, 80, 100. And if we expose these receptors to oxygen, to, to uh, perfusion or to blood that contains partial pressure of oxygen exceeding 200, 300, up to 500, their activity will eventually will stop. So the, their activity then is increased when we have larger, lower partial pressure. And as I said, they start to respond basically when the partial pressure of the blood perfusing these cells is below 70 or between 60 and 50. The effect of hypoxia is potentiated when we have uh, at the same time elevation in uh, carbon uh, dioxide partial pressure in the arterial blood. So this is again the partial pressure of O2 in the arterial blood and this is the alveolar ventilation liters per minute. Say this is the normal here. As you can see when our partial pressure of O2 in the blood is above 80, you can see it's about 5 liters per minute. Now, when the partial pressure of O2 drops to 60, the activity of the, this will stimulate the aortic and carotid baroreceptor, and it will these these receptor will send a signal to the respiratory center to increase the rate of ventilation. And you can see under severe hypoxia, when the partial pressure of O2 is about 40, there is a dramatic increase in in in, in the rate of ventilation. And if you take a case where we have a, a larger partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood, you can see that the, the response of hypoxia start to occur early on. You know, the rate of ventilation will be enhanced. This, be, this is probably due to the action of CO2 and hydrogen ion on the receptors as well. So you have a dual effect, one due to hypoxia and the other one due to to CO2 and look at this one there when we have hyperkabinia and the partial pressure of arterial blood is about 50 you can see the dramatic increase in ventilation even at higher partial pressure of oxygen and the lower the partial pressure of oxygen uh, the, the higher is the ventilation at even uh, 80 or even 100 millimeters of mercury of oxygen so in, in simple term the response of hypoxia uh, and to the increase in the ventilation that occurs as a result of inputs from the chemoreceptors which detects the hypoxia is enhanced or potentiated by elevated carbon. This slide shows you to excitation of the of the central chemoreceptors and eventually the change in the activity or stimulation of the inspiratory group in neurons in the dorsal respiratory group and due to ventilation co2 apparently enters from the plasma to the csf combined with hydrogen ion formed by carbonic acid the bicarbonic acid dissociate and release bicarbonate and hydrogen and now hydrogen ions are located within the csf so we'll go and affect the activity of the chemosensitive neurons. And from these guys, eventually, uh, you know, the, the signal will be transmitted to the dorsal respiratory group and increase the rate of ventilation. Now, this slide shows you uh, the differences between the effect of CO2 and hydrogen ion concentration. Now you can see this is the partial pressure of CO2 here, and this is the alveolar ventilation. Now you can see if the partial pressure of CO2 start to go beyond 40-45, the rate of ventilation increases steadily. And this is probably the mechanism 
or this mechanism or this increase is apparently due to the effect of CO2 in the central chemoreceptor. So the central response is more powerful. Now, if you take the peripheral response here, you can see that the, the peripheral chemoreceptor sensitive to hydrogen ion directly. They are sensitive to CO2, but look, the increase in the ventilation due to changes in pH, if we have a decline in the pH as a result of, of you know, CO2 production or ketoacidosis or whatever, what's going to happen? This pH will stimulate these chemoreceptors to increase ventilation. But see, you can see that the responsiveness or the central response is more dramatic than the peripheral response. Next slide. Now, remember, uh, in, in, I just mentioned that the effect of the peripheral chemoreceptors to hypoxia is potentiated in the presence of increased levels of carbon dioxide. By the same token here, if you have, if you determine the response or the rate of alveolar ventilation at different CO2 levels. This is the CO2 partial pressure, and this is the alveolar ventilation here. Let's say that our partial pressure of oxygen was normal. It's 100 right there. Now you can see that the PCO2 has to go up beyond 40 to, to increase the rate of ventilation. If you have a condition where you have a PO2 of 50, you can see the responsiveness or the rate of ventilation is higher, even at lower partial pressure of carbon dioxide. This, let's say, starts at 40. In the presence of hypoxia, the response or the rate of ventilation is due to the effect of CO2 in these baroreceptor, it's going to start a bit earlier. And by the same token, if you have hypoxia, severe hypoxia here, where the BO2 is 35, you can see when the BCO2 is 35, there is a dramatic large increase in the rate of ventilation. So here the response is steeper. So again, this slide summarizes for you or shows you that. <coughs> <coughs> the rate of ventilation in response to changes the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is potentiated in the presence of hypoxia. Now, from the previous discussion, we know that uh, an increase in partial pressure of CO2 will stimulate mainly the central chemoreceptor, but potentially it could also stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptor in the aortic bodies and in the carotid bodies. And this is the normal care. This is our normal BCO2. Now you can see an increase in CO2. There is a steady increase in the rate of alveolar ventilation or alveolar ventilation. Now this sometimes even this response could be potentiated or could be depressed in different conditions. For example, if you take a patient with metabolic acidosis, like uh, uh, diabetic ketosis in a diabetic patient, uh, the, the responsiveness of ventilation due to input from the chemoreceptor is way enhanced. I mean, you start to see an increase in the rate of ventilation even at lower partial pressures of CO2. This is because of due to the increase of hydrogen ion, which directly act on the peripheral chemoreceptors. If you take sleep, sleep actually the activity of the reticular activating system is depressed and this will lead to the depression of our respiratory center or a decline in the activity of our respiratory center. And the reticular activating system, there is a collection or a group of neurons within the brain stem that are involved in the control of our state of wakefulness and sleep, something you will take in details when you take the neuroscience course. If you take, for example, narcotics, barbiturates, uh, it, it, even, you know, you need higher partial pressure of CO2 to induce uh, an increase in rate of ventilation. And anesthesia, due to the, due to the depression 
of the central nervous system activity, including the reticular activating system. You can see you, the, the BCO2 could go real high before we can get an increase in the rate of ventilation. This slide shows you I added here a couple of drugs like morphine and barbiturates. And you can see uh, that uh, the, 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 the sensitivity of the response to the changes in the partial pressure of CO2, the, the responsiveness of the respiratory centers as well as the, 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 the chemoreceptors uh, will change. In other words, uh, you have higher responsiveness when you have metabolic acidosis because you have here metabolic acidosis apparently stimulating the peripheral chemoreceptors. And if you have a change in CO2, this will act on the central chemoreceptor. So you have, in a sense, a dual input. Whereas in case, for example, of uh, uh, drugs which depress the activity of the central nervous system like anesthesia, now you can see here the responsiveness or the sensitivity of the response to changes in CO2 is declining and even the threshold is higher. In other words, you can see that we need higher partial pressure uh, during anesthesia to, to, to cause an uh, increase in, in the rate of ventilation compared to the normal one. Now, the, of, uh, for example, change in BH and the CO2, and uh, the, the, these lines here, sometimes they are called fan-like things. And uh, you can see that uh, this is the arterial BCO2 and this is the alveolar ventilation. Now you can see uh, within, within the normal range here, uh, we have the alveolar ventilation within about uh, five liters uh, per minute. And uh, if, you have, if you increase the partial pressure of CO2, when the partial pressure of O2 is 100, it's going to go up, and this is proportional to the increase in the partial pressure of CO2. Now, you can see if the partial pressure of O2 is lower than normal, like 60 or 50 and 40, you can see that the, the response is steeper. In other words, the, 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 response, is, the, the response is higher or steeper. And uh, this is due to the combined effect of hypoxia and uh, uh, CO2. So you think about it in the presence of one, the presence of one factor, like if we have CO2 alone, the effect will be less than if we have CO2 and hypoxia. Now the green lines here, the green lines, and now all of these red lines here where there was a change in the PCO2, but there was no change in BH, but there was a change in both the partial pressure of O2 and the partial pressure of CO2. With these curves here, okay, this is when we have acidosis. You can see that the BH is a 3 here. Now you can see, you know, that the threshold is lower. In other words, the response is going to occur at lower, at lower levels of of O2 at lower levels of PCO2. So this, these guys here, the green line shows you the rate of ventilation under different conditions where we have different alveolar BCO2, we have acidosis, and we have hypoxia. In other words, if you have hypoxia and uh, acidosis, the responsiveness or the rate of ventilation uh, due to changes in CO2 is gonna be more dramatic or it will be enhanced. That's what it says, basically. And this is a summary here. Uh, now, I just want to say one thing that the, the role of these chemoreceptors in detecting particularly hypoxia is important because if we don't have these chemoreceptors, what's going to happen, the hypoxia will depress the activity of the central nervous system in neurons which are involved in the control of our ventilation and we are be, we are going to be in a troubles. The CO2 may still work in these receptors. However, if hypoxia is progressive and it wasn't detected by the, 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 the chemoreceptors, the aortic and the carotid bodies chemoreceptors, we are in troubles because eventually the activity of the respiratory control center in the brain will be, will be 
depressed by progressive hypoxia. So that's where the importance of these uh, O2 receptors, namely the carotid and the aortic bodies. We talked about the central or brain control of ventilation, and then we talked about uh, the chemoreceptors, both central chemoreceptors and peripheral chemoreceptors, and their role in the control of ventilation. Now we'll talk about non-chemical influence on respiration. And these are mediated by receptors which are located in the lung and uh, in, the highway, in the airways. And that's also, there are so many of these reflexes, it's confusing. Uh, we have spoken about some of them when we talked about the sneezing and the, the, the coughing reflexes. So these are reflexes which interferes in a sense with our uh, respiration. And uh, I don't know if you want to remember the details of all of them. I will focus which ones you need to control of breathing. Uh, there are reflexes which are initiated by stimulation of different types of receptors within the lung. For example, stretch receptors, which are located in the smooth muscles of the large and small airways. And these, the, these receptors respond to lung inflation when the, the lung volume gets so high, so it prevents basically the rupture of the alveoli and it minimizes the work of breathing by inhibiting taking large uh, tidal volumes. And the best example is uh, a, a reflex known herring brewer reflex. I will talk about this in some more details. Now, there are also receptors which are known as J receptors or juxtapulmonary receptors. Uh, they are located in the capillary wall and in the interstitium between the capillary and the alveoli, and these are usually stimulated by uh, uh, particularly pulmonary congestion due to edema as a result of heart failure. And once they are stimulated, uh, they, they, they induce rapid shallow breathing or tachypnea, and uh, they are also believed to be involved in our feeling of dyspnea uh, when we have pulmonary congestion or pulmonary edema due to heart failure. Uh, similarly, these receptors seem to be stimulated in a person with pulmonary embolism, and once they are stimulated, they, they induce either tachypnea or apnea. So the two responses are possible, but I don't know the exact explanation how the, these work. These are some, uh, we have irritant receptors, which are caused by inhalation of irritant substances like pollens or some other uh, gases, and these are located in the nasal mucosa, upper airways, and possibly alveoli. Uh, they usually, when they are stimulated, they cause bronchoconstriction. Uh, there is a possibility that they may cause cough and sneezing, and we talked about cough and sneezing early on. We have the atrial baroreceptors. The, their main function, as you may know, they are for the regulation of blood pressure. But once uh, these receptors are stimulated by elevation of blood pressure, it will result in brief apnea in some people and bronchodilation. And we have also receptors in the muscles and the tendons. And uh, uh, which are even located in the muscles of respiration as well as in skeletal muscles and the joint. The, 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 the important of these are the ones which are present in the joints and in the tendons. And it is believed that these are the ones which induce hyper, exercise hyperpenia by sending their inputs to the respiratory center at the onset of our exercise or during the exercise to increase the rate of ventilation. So they make adjustment in, in, the, in the rate of ventilation or our ventilation, so to speak, uh, uh, due to elevated workload or during exercise. Sometimes even pain, somatic pain, if you are exposed for somatic pain, it will increase ventilation and it will also increase the heart rate and the total vascular resistance. And I'm sure that you know the effect of pain on the cardiovascular system from your previous module. Now, this is the herring brewer reflex. 
uh, herring brewer reflex uh, there is an inflation reflex or a reflex that occurs in, during inflation and apparently there is another one that occurs during deflation but the bottom line these reflexes occur due to changes in lung volume one occurs while we are taking a, 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 a deep inspiration and the other one occurs during deflation of the lung and uh, the, the, when there is an increase in the tidal volume you stretch the receptor within the smooth muscles of the large and the small airways and the afferent pathway is carried through the vagus nerve and inhibits the activity of the dorsal respiratory group to inhibit or to turn off the, the inspiration so that we go to expiration. Uh, originally, it was believed that this reflex is important in determination of the rate and the depth of ventilation. Thus, this view is no longer valid. Recent study, though, as I said, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a for uh, the control of the rate and the depth of breathing because the threshold for the reflex is much higher than the normal tidal volume during tidal or eupenic breathing. In other words, you have to increase the tidal volume of a person between eight, up to 800 to 800 ml to 1.5 or 1500 ml because you can elicit such as a reflex such a reflex in conscious eupenic adults. And that's these data or, you know, these conclusions suggest that the herring brewer inflation reflex is not important for the control of the depth and the rate of breathing. And as I said previously, it's probably the central control through the pneumotaxic center, which is the one that sets the rate and uh, the depth of breathing. However, uh, still, this reflex may have a value in minimizing the work of breathing by inhibiting large tidal volumes, as well as preventing over distension of the alveoli. In neonates, okay, uh, have uh, neonates have herring brewer inflation reflex threshold within their normal tidal volume range, and this reflex may be important, may have an important influence in their tidal volume and respiratory rate. So. The herring brewer reflex role in controlling the tidal volume, preventing over distension of the alveoli, might be important in the neonates because this reflex is elicited in neonates within the normal limits of their tidal volume. And uh, apparently, in, uh, there is a reflex by which when our lungs are deflated, uh, there is a reflux which tend to increase the rate of ventilation and uh, it could be due to the inhibition or decreasing the activity of the stretch receptors which are stimulated during inflation of the lungs. So it's the reverse of the herring brewer inflation reflex and it could be stimulated by the irritant receptors or J receptors. The details of this reflex are not very well known, but it could be the, the J receptors, the stretch receptors in the lung, and uh, the vagus nerve is the one which carry uh, the, 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 the response of these receptors to the respiratory neurons to induce uh, an increase in the rate of ventilation or uh, an increase in ventilation or hyperpnea. And, uh, uh, it could be also occurring when you have a pneumothorax where it could induce uh, an increase in ventilation when the lungs are deflated in persons with pneumothorax. It might be also important in the periodic spontaneous deep breath or when we increase our breathing or the depth of our breathing uh, during uh, emotional disturbances like sadness, grief, or it could occur uh, during relief if you are, you know, I mean, upset about something and there was a breakthrough and you get happy about, you know, the new development of a sad event or something. This, these are known as psi, psi. And these psi's are usually consist of uh, slow deep inspiration, larger than normal tidal volume and followed by a slow deep expiration. 
and apparently this occurs during the deflation of our lung spontaneously uh, it could have some application when we give patient on a, mechan on a mechanical ventilator uh, they usually give them a bit of tidal volume and then to maintain uh, to prevent atelectasis so so I'm not sure how that works but just keep it in mind also, the herring brewer deflation reflex, particularly, might be important in the maintenance of FRC in infants because these guys, uh, the infants, still their elastic recoil of the lung and the chest wall uh, is not similar to that in an adult. Uh, the inward recoil of their lung is larger than the outward recoil of of their very compliant chest wall. I mean, you know, still the chest wall hasn't been developed. Uh, so apparently, uh, you know, they, they, they may have a tendency to get a smaller, uh, a, a smaller residual volume and uh, a smaller FRC than necessarily because of the elastic recoil of the lungs larger. So apparently, the, this reflex, which leads to uh, of uh, taking deeper inspirations during deflation may help to maintain uh, their uh, uh, normal FRC. I, you know, this is just a hypothesis I read somewhere, but that's something that you may want to remember. It's nice to know, but you don't have to know the details of this. Now, uh, I just want to highlight a little bit about the voluntary control of breathing. And I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture that the rhythmicity of breathing can be completely overridden or halted or stopped by influence from higher brain center. In fact, uh, somebody can breathe uh, or the rate of the, his ventilation could be much higher than the ventilation introduced by exercise or by hypercapnia or hypoxia voluntarily. And in these people, I mean, the, 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 the rate of vent or the ventilation could be way much higher. And this is referred to as maximum, maximum voluntary ventilation. In other words, if somebody wants voluntarily to hyperventilate, his alveolar ventilation could be way much higher than those even occurring during the exercise. And sometimes they use this maximum voluntary ventilation for exercise studies or to access the respiratory function. Uh, that's so the, 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 the increase, what, in other words, one can increase his ventilation voluntarily. And this is due to the override of the normal respiratory cycle in, induced by the spontaneous activity of the respiratory centers. And this is apparently due to cerebral inputs, basically. Not just that, one can actually hold his breath for minutes. I mean, you know, I mean, you can stop breathing, but you cannot do it for a long time because eventually when you hypoventilate or when you stop your breathing, the CO2 and the, uh, will rise, the, uh, you will have hypoxia and uh, you will have acidosis and these uh, these factors will stimulate the chemoreceptors and you, the, 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 over, the, the holding of the breath will be over and the point where holding of the breath is over is known as the breaking point and this is for example uh, known that during for example speech or singing or playing, playing uh, a musical instrument the normal cycle of inspiration and expiration is automatically modified by higher brain center. That's why I, uh, singers, you know, I mean, could, you know, hold their breath for some time, but it won't be forever because eventually they will reach to their breaking point and ventilation will resume. And in addition to this, I mentioned this in the lecture, sometimes emotional states could uh, cause the chronic hyperventilation and even this hyperventilation could be so severe to the point that these these people may develop respiratory alkalosis as a result of uh, increased elimination of carbon dioxide something mentioned what it doesn't occur in our life because our ventilation system maintains adequate amount of o2 and co2 in, in, in the arterial blood 
and whenever we have changes in the arterial O2 or in arterial CO2 and consequently changes in the CO2 and the high oxygen and the CSF uh, will be adjusted. In other words, if we have hypercapnia or hypoxia, our receptors will modify the respiratory drive so that we bring things back to normal. Now, in some people who may have low cardiac output uh, due to heart failure or if they have uremia or brain tumors, uh, you may observe certain weird changes in, in, uh, in, in their breathing pattern. And actually, the occurrence of, of uh, this type of breathing, chinostoc breathing, is a bad sign. It means that the patient is really in serious troubles. So, a chinostoc breathing is uh, uh, characterized by cyclic episodes of apnea, as you can see here, there is no breathing, followed by a period of hyperventilation. So, this is a period of hyperventilation and this is a period of apnea followed by a period of hyperventilation. Now, apparently, this period of hyperventilation is due to the increase in CO2 as well as in uh, the hypoxia. And this will set the, stimulate the chemoreceptor to cause an increase in, in, in ventilation. And then when you hyperventilate for some time, the level of CO2 and O2 will decline and the activity of the respiratory neurons and the input of the chemoreceptor to these respiratory neurons uh, will decline and that's why you, you will have this apnea and then as a result of apnea there will be a build up of uh, CO2 again, hypoxia again and it will stimulate another uh, period of hyperventilation. So apparently the, the waxing and waning of the tidal volume and the pattern of ventilation here, you can see you start with a small tidal volume and the tidal volume goes up, up, up and down, down, down. Then we have apnea, then you start ventilating again with a bit of low cardiac, of low tidal volume. The tidal volume will go up and up and then start going down. Now, uh, in your book, he talks about, uh, you know, I mean, he explains how this may occur. If you have, this is like, the, this is the PCO2 of the respiratory neuron. When the PCO2 of the respiratory neuron is high, apparently due to stimulation of the central chemoreceptors, it will increase the rate of ventilation by modifying the activity of the neurons. You know, because CO2 will stimulate the chemoreceptor and these will stimulate the dorsal respiratory group in the medulla. Now, as a result of this, okay, the increase in ventilation here, uh, or the hyperventilation will lead to a decline in the VCO2 surrounding in the CSF or in the chemoreceptor, and thus the respiratory drive will shut off and you will get apnea, and then this apnea will lead to an increase in the PCO2 again, and this will set again another uh, episode of uh, hyperventilation. And then he relates uh, these changing to, to changes in the uh, PCO2 of arterial blood. Now, when you have an increase in the PCO2 of arterial blood, the, uh, you, for example, if you have inadequate blood flow to the brain or change in the s sensitivity of the CO2 receptor in disease states, uh, the, the, the BCO2 of, uh, of, of, of the lung and the BCO2 in the CSF do not necessarily match. In other words, if you have an increase in the BCO2 here, and then you get this episodic uh, period of hyperventilation, the BCO2 will start to decline in both in the CSF and in the blood. But see, the, the, the period of hypoventilation will lead to an increase in both the CO2 of the arterial blood as well as the CO2 in the CSF. But apparently due to the lack of inadequate blood flow, they, they, don't, they don't match. In other words, one of them occurs after the other. I don't think you should worry too much about the details of it. All I want you to be aware of this phenomenon or this pattern of breathing and uh, 
to remember it's due to delay changes in the BCO2 of the CF of the, the that there is a delay between the changes in the CO2 pulmonary blood and the delay changes in the BCO2 of CSF. So I don't think you should worry about the exact mechanism, just be aware of it and just remember it. And uh, there is another type of cosmal breathing known as cosmal breathing, and this is characterized by deep rapid breathing pattern, and uh, it's uh, uh, it indicates usually acidosis, and this is typically observed in, uh, uh, for example, uh, in patients who have uh, diabetes and the uncontrolled diabetes type 2 1 and they have keto acidosis. They start to breathe really deeply and uh, at a very fast rate. Then this is known as cosmic breathing. This is also something that you should remember because it's important in the diagnosis of keto acidosis. And then for you also to remember, we have uh, uh, what's known as a sleep apnea. In other words, somebody is breathing normally and suddenly his breathing stops or he'll have a period of apnea and then he resumes the breathing. And uh, there are two types of, or two main types of apnea. One of them is known as a sleep apnea, okay? central sleep apnea and this apparently occurs during sleep okay and this slide shows you here here is the the air flow or you know the tidal volume if you want to call it then this is the apnea and then the breathing is resumed and you can see that in uh, in uh, in uh, obstruct in uh, central sleep apnea uh, it's uh, there is no attempt for the person the person to sleep as demonstrated by no oscillation in the pleural pressure. In other words, uh, in the central sleep apnea, we don't know how it occurs, but in some people they just their breathing is stops during sleep, and they don't attempt you know to override this period of apnea because there is no change in the pleural pressure, whereas an obstructive sleep apnea if somebody has apnea due to obstruction you can see the patient is still making efforts to breathe but he he cannot do this due to obstruction again the details of these two main types and how they occur are you know you don't have to know the details just remember them what's the sleep apnea means and the, remember the two main types of sleep apnea obstructive sleep apnea and uh, central sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is basic occurs in a patient who is sleeping. For example, if he, you know, if he chokes while he's sleeping or something, and get her way, his or her airways obstructed, and he cannot breathe. Whereas in sleep apnea, uh, uh, it, it is kind of due to disturbance in the central control of our breathing and then if you want just to know as a definition what the respiratory failure means uh, there is respirat the respiratory system basically fails in one or both of, of its gas exchange function either we cannot get enough oxygen or we cannot eliminate carbon dioxide in other words if you have uh, some problem with your respiratory system that is causing hypoxia or hypercapnia this will may this is this is considered to be respiratory failure because under normal conditions even if we face changes in the co2 and o2 for one reason or the other our respiratory control system is capable of adjusting the the, the levels of bo2 and co2 in our arterial blood and uh, it could be classified as hypoxemic or hypercapnic respiratory failure. Uh, hypoxemia means that uh, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is, is low down, and uh, it could be lower than 60 with a normal or lower arterial CO2. And this is uh, the, one of the most common forms of respiratory failure. Sometimes uh, respiratory failure is characterized by an increase in the partial pressure of CO2 more than 50. 
And also, you know, in these patients, usually when you have hyperkapenia or respiratory failure associated with hyperkapenia, it's more or less, uh, it will be associated as well with hypoxemia, okay? And uh, that, uh, that will do it. I know that might be a, that might have been a long lecture, but it's not too bad. It could be worse.